Hey, Verballers, before we get started, did you know the future's coming? Why not make it brighter today with Squarespace? Squarespace makes it easy to turn your idea into a unique website. Showcase your work, blog, publish content, even sell products and services of all kinds. All it takes is a few simple clicks. Customize everything from look and feel to settings and products. Use beautiful templates created by world-class designers. There is nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Head out to squarespace.com today for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SOLID. That's S-O-L-I-D. And you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrandt. Joining me as always, over there in stunning <laughs> New York City, Dan Rubenstein. Sir, how are you? It's been nice out, huh? It's been real warm. Yeah, a little stanky. I, You know what? I did sweat for the first time in a long time because of warmth, not because I'm a disgusting person yesterday. Sure. So that's a good sign. I mean, I think it's about to like rain and be disgusting, but life is all right. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good. It's going to rain for like the next 96 hours or something. Is that true? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, but it's good to be with you on the pod. We released our... Much awaited How Recruiting Works show a week ago. If you haven't had a chance to go and check that out, please do so. We put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that one over the span of about a year to collect all of our audio and produce it the way we want it. So please do check that out. Can I have a moment of honesty about the show? Sure. It didn't fully take us a year. <laughs> we started it to release last year for signing day, right? Correct. On and off. On and off over right. the span of a year. I would I would say a lot of what we do, because people seem to like the minutia. I know I do when hearing about what you put into the show. Um, a lot of it is like, oh, man, we made it. And then we're like, mm, I don't know if I like it. Let's start again. Yep. And that's, that's like how it gets better eventually. And I was a fan of where we were with it last year. I really like how it came out this year. We tore it apart. Yeah. Four or five weeks ago. Tore the whole damn Jump thing Jump into apart. the lab. Yeah, <laughs> tore the whole thing apart, reconstructed it in a different image, and I think it turned out better. So we're yeah. excited about it. A lot of folks who have responded are excited about it as well. If you haven't had a chance to listen, please go out and do so. The other thing that I'll mention then, I guess on the heels of that, is that since it is end of month, what we're trying to do end of each month, mm -hmm. at least for the foreseeable future, is a Q&A show. This is true. Collect all the questions that come in, mm -hmm. and then let's record. Let's answer Simple some questions. Enough. Yeah. Um, I I was thinking about this earlier. Did we start our show? It was either pre-Twitter or just when Twitter was starting out. Because our sound, and I don't think you have the soundboard in front of you, our sound was like, you've got mail. Because it was, you know, people sending emails, solidverbal at gmail.com, and that's how we would retrieve. Yeah. And we still get a ton of email, and we try to answer it, but... This is largely, what, Twitter and Facebook? Twitter, Facebook, yeah. The next, I think the next one we do will be, what, end of March, and that, I think we're going to do Reddit only. How about that? That sounds good to me. I like, we'll go to the, I, I mean, the Solid Verbal subreddit is outstanding, so we'll do that. Congratulations, Skippy. You've got mail. You've got mail. On the Solid Verbal. All right, well, on that note, Dan, let's do our mm -hmm. best to pay homage <sighs> to those folks who... Wrote in via whatever channel they so desired, be it social, be it via email. Got a whole slew of them here. We want to do our best to try and address them in kind. So, Daniel, if you could reach deep into that into that pot o' luck of questions here <laughs> and pull out uh, pull out a good one for us. All right, let's start at the top. This is from Benjamin. Most intriguing conference, top to bottom, next year. Ooh, so. I, I, I like how he phrased this because best or worst conference doesn't really tell a complete story. It's largely subjective, as is intriguing. But intriguing is also 
nice because I think we can better define that, right? Sure, of course. We can better better define the subjective nature of that word. So to me, intriguing is a a weird stew, a boulia base, if you will, mm, yeah. of coaching intrigue, quarterback intrigue, and attrition intrigue. So like, oh my God, they lost their entire offense. Oh my God, they lost their entire coaching staff. And to me, if if his phrasing is top to bottom, it's probably the SEC. Because I, I feel like that's where the, the bullion base is in terms of intrigue with new coaches. And you have a quarterback who came in in the second half and won the national championship. You have you know a, a Heisman candidate in Jarrett Stidham. We have a what is Florida's offense going to look like? Are they going to start a true freshman with a new coach? Whatever. But if, it, if the question were top to middle, my answer is the Big Ten. Okay. Because the Big Ten to me has more wild card fun with Purdue and Nebraska ensconced in that middle section. In the torso, if you will. Whoa. Ensconced, baby. Whoa. All right. <sighs> Bring in your fastball here. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, the, the ACC isn't doing it for me as much. The Pac 12 seems too similar and questionable. And I think it'll still be fun. The Big 12 feels like it hasn't changed all that much. It's just sort of like, what is he going to do in year two, Tom Herman and Lincoln Riley? So. That's my answer. Where, where do you start? My answer is actually the Pac-12. Really? Why? And uh, perhaps it's just a matter of semantics and a matter of definition around the word intriguing. And yeah. furthermore, the definition of intriguing in a college football sense. What does it mean to you? For me, intriguing is questionable. What is the most questionable? That's what I find intriguing. And look, you could always make the case for the SEC being intriguing. There, mm-hmm. There's not a season that we've done this show that I haven't thought about the SEC in some intriguing way. I'm always mm-hmm. intrigued by it. And I think the same holds true for the Big Ten, certainly the Big Ten now, as we've had a team like a Penn State really rise up under James Franklin, new coaches uh, abound in the Big Ten. That makes it an intriguing conference. That was the case last year as well. The Pac-12, mm-hmm. though, I have no idea which direction the Pac-12 is headed because USC without Sam Darnold could go one of a hundred different directions. Arizona fired their coach like two weeks ago. Something crazy like that. Uh, Arizona State, we're not sure their coach knows what's going on. (laughs) Oregon had to scramble and find a new coach at the gun. Yet again, yeah. And oh, by the way, Charles Chip Kelly coming back to the college game down there at UCLA. There are a lot of variables in the Pac-12 that, to me, I don't know which direction it's headed, and that makes it really intriguing from top to bottom for me. So are you intrigued by the bottom of the Pac-12? Like the the Oregon State, Cal, Colorado, you know, you can, I guess, put Utah, even though they were the only, I believe, Pac-12 team to win a bowl game? Yeah. Uh, if if the night or what what is it the the day is darkest before dawn whatever whatever that phrasing is eleven of twelve Pac twelve teams finished the season with a loss so it's certainly not looking great the South should be wide open ish you can make a case for probably three teams yeah uh, pretty evenly winning that division in USC Arizona and UCLA actually three and a half with Utah I have the least amount of certainty about the Pac twelve. There, okay. there are more variables to me in the Pac-12 than any other conference, and that's what makes it intriguing top to bottom. So you get you get hot and bothered by the, that's right. the mystery. Extremely. Yeah, I'm dangerous. Seduced. Right. Okay. I, I can appreciate that. And the ACC, the only reason I don't lump in the ACC with the others is outside. I mean, l- listen, Miami and Virginia Tech and Clemson and Florida State all have intriguing things about them. To right. me, it's not even like top to bottom it's more top and bottom are interesting to me. The middle class of the ACC right now, Virginia, Pitt, Louisville, I guess BC and Wake. I don't, I don't see there. there, There's not a huge mystery factor. Dan, I feel like you could have a template saved on your computer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. With that statement (laughs) here, ACC team dot doc X. And you could pretty much apply that to about eight teams in the middle. I, I I'm with you, Ty. So and by the way, low key on that, the AAC is going to be really intriguing next year. Okay. All right. The American's going to be real nice because I think Memphis returns a good amount. You still have UCF with the talent from last year. I think Jeff Collins improves Temple next year. Navy's always going to be fun. Like, I think that is going to be not, not underrated, but just 
consistently rated as fun and deep. How about that? Fun and deep. Moving fun on. Fun and deep. Where are we going next? Uh, let's go to... Oh, I like this. This was a big thing this week. I think it was Dennis Dodd from CBS who wrote about it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But Beef McLarge Huge. Is that a real name? Assume. That's, that's that probably is a not family a family name. name. Yeah, okay. In your opinion, what is the reason, and I will parenthetically add reasons, for the decline in attendance at college football games? So what did Dennis Dodd go with? Kids care about their phones and there's not enough bandwidth? Kids these days, Ty. Okay. Th- by the way, thank you for listening to this show on your phone. We are yeah. very grateful. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not the approach I would take. It's certainly yeah. one interpretation. Uh, I think that part of the reason why is because the home experience is so damn enjoyable. I think it's part of it. Sometimes the easiest answer and the best answer is the most straightforward. I mm-hmm. enjoy, as a college football fan, infinitely more watching the game from the comfort of my couch on my HD television, not having to fight off crowds of 100,000 to watch a football game. I would posit this, Ty. I, I think you're completely right. I My question is, is going to a football game and forget about traffic, forget about, you know, cleaning up and setting up tailgating, forget about like parking and the pain in the ass of, you know, oh, I got to park on this shady dude's lawn because it's $800 to park for the, whatever. Forget about all of that. Is football fun to watch in person? Like, um, is it a sport built for an in-person experience? It's built more for an in-person experience than baseball. But I can tell you that the commercial breaks during a football game, particularly an NFL game, if you've ever been to one of those, yeah, that aspect of it is very much a killjoy when you're in, in the stands. And at least if you're at home, you can find things to do. You can check Twitter. You can like go to the bathroom. Move your bowels. Yeah, we're same page. You have options when the game goes to commercial break that you don't have if you're actually there in attendance. I would almost push back, and I know this is going to be sacrilege on a college football show. I, I may like going to baseball games, and I'm not even a huge baseball fan. I think there's something a little more honest. Like, baseball's like, yeah, we're slow. Just chill out. Yeah. Look at the grass. <laughs> we walk to you with the food and the beverages. <laughs> okay. There's something that, like, is a very entertaining screensaver where it never really gets high impact and exciting. And football is like, high impact, exciting, stop. High impact, exciting, stop. And that, I think, is the bigger issue. Or football just might not be a great in-person sport. It, it's it's better with everything filled in by TV. That also said, if I were paid to improve the in-person experience, I mean, you know what I'm going to say. I want more comfortable seating. Yeah. And I want better, cheaper food. You can't just serve me boiled hot dogs and dry burgers. You just can't. And I know, I think it's the, the new Falcon Stadium where the national championship also was this year. Mercedes-Benz, I yep, think. Yep, yep. They have a bunch of local vendors. The Brooklyn Nets, not too far from where I am broadcasting this very show. They have local a local sausage place, local Mexican place. Like, there is something that's pretty familiar and exciting of like, oh, you can also eat and consume well while you're there. And that I don't think is the, the case with a lot of these schools. Tickets are also really expensive. They are. And we are very much in an age where it's easier now than ever to be very cost conscious. And mm-hmm. do a line item on everything you pay out in the span of a month, and you can be the biggest fan in the world. Never go to a game. You don't. Yeah. You don't have to anymore because the coverage is there. You can watch whatever you want. All that said, the ceiling is still higher. If you're in the stadium for something incredible for your team, a huge upset, a huge play, a, sure. whatever, the the communal experience that untouchable. I don't. I don't begrudge anyone who chooses to go to the game. Yeah. I'm just trying to, as you said, posit a theory as to why more people don't. Fair. All right. Where are we going next? Colin wants to know, combination of questions. One, does it get hard to be, quote, impartial? I use quotes because of Ty's blatant disrespect. So blatant. Yeah. Of Michigan State this past season. He says MSU. So maybe it's Mississippi State. I don't know. Sure. Two, least favorite team or fan base. I I have an interesting answer to this. Um, God, here we go. Yeah. Please buckle up. Mm-hmm. I, for for starters, part of, I think, the charm of what we do is that we we never try to mask our rooting allegiances. Like, you're an Oregon grad, you're an Oregon fan. Yep. And I don't think in any case we're gushing 
over the teams that we root for. If anything, it's more bitching and moaning. Right, about exactly. The teams you root for, yeah, exactly. Uh, but we don't hide the fact that we have some rooting allegiance. So that that part is, I think, just that we're authentic. Uh, what I'll say is, it actually gets easier to be impartial the longer you do this because you reach a point where, in order to cover it the way we cover it, you have to imbibe so much college football all the time, and some of that raw emotion gets boiled off just just as part of the natural machinations of what we do. The My least favorite team or fan base, my least favorite team is any team who is boring because no. for a living, I talk about this and I want weird and exciting and fun and creative. And so, and that will vary year to year, uh, the, the boringness quotient or whatever of a team. So that, that really is everything to me. It's if, do you play slow? Are you, con- are you throwing well short of the sticks on third and four? Are you punting from your opponents? 39. Like I, that to me, I, that is tough to be impartial about like, well, you, this is how they're thinking in defense of that move. No, that is, that is garbage. And that is who I root against anybody that is playing conservatively and for field position. That is extremely boring and soft. So that is who I do not like. I, I definitely do not have a specific team right, or fan base that is my least favorite to answer part two of Colin's question. I, there is not one team. There is not one base that I detest more than any other. Uh, one thing that we get, though, pretty frequently mm-hmm. that in my estimation means we're doing it correctly. <laughs> yeah. There are multiple teams and multiple fan bases who believe in earnest that we are the least favorite. And that yeah. tells me that we're spreading around the hate just around about the right amount. Mm-hmm. And the fact that there are more than one out there, that that to me says we're doing something right. I should say, after we hit stop when we record, we just bitch about Michigan. The all the time. Week. That's all we all do. All the time. All um, right. Kevin Wade, our pal, wants to know, would you rather your team win a college football championship but then move to the FCS level? Oh. Okay. So a demotion, a relegation yeah, for relegation. being too good. Or go into every season knowing you'll never get above second place in your conference. And I say that with a defending champion. <laughs> I think coming in third place in their conference. Right. If that makes sense. So, okay. What what is it? Would you rather have a ceiling or a a hard success and a hard floor? There is there is nothing more frustrating than that glass ceiling. Okay. There is nothing more frustrating than knowing at the start of a season you can't get above second place. And I think in large part that's why Every program outside Alabama in the SEC has changed mm-hmm. coaches in the span that he's been at Bama. Right. Because on some level, everyone's felt that 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 ceiling, man. You can't get past Alabama. So, no, I don't want to be in that position. It drives people crazy. I'd much rather win and then get relegated. Uh, we'll play in the big sky for the next 15 years. But at Hell least yeah. you'll always have that championship moment. Where he got to hold up the trophy standing next to our boy, Grandpa, Bill Hancock. I disagree. How about that? I haven't said that in a while. Um, I It would be miserable. You wouldn't be able to watch your team if they were an FCS team, depending on where you lived. You'd have to watch it on like ESPN3. You can watch or it on Stadium. The Stadium Network. Right. Come um, on. Which looks good. I think our pal Jeff Schwartz does stuff for them. Kristen Balboni. All sorts of good people. But it would it would kind of be boring to go from rooting every year for an FBS team to an FCS team Do you level think? Of competition. I mean, if it's the same team, if Notre Dame won a national championship and then was in the big sky, they would still attract a lot of talent. And Sir, just people, every game. people love the Patriot League lightning round on this show. I know they do. They do, they do. I guess would that be, make the most sense FCS conference wise for Notre Dame? <sighs> I don't know. I, I have might no be idea. Too central. Maybe. Yeah. Let's get some Notre Dame Mount Union action. I think they're like D3. Um, <laughs> that'd be wonderful. Shout out Wisconsin Whitewater. Uh, no, I would take second place because one, you can still get to the national championship coming in second place in your conference with the playoff. And two, I've said this before. I don't know that it is in, in an era where everything is so weighted towards the top and the teams that have the most money and the geographic advantages that if you have a fun season where you beat two of your rivals that's that feels like a success and you know with the way everything is i would 
take that more often than not. And coming in second place in your conference, and I know it's not, it's a ceiling of second place. It still means you're making the conference championship game every so often. I think I'm going with that. I'm wow. still going with the excitement huh. of playing okay. FP. I just, I don't want to watch FCS football every week. Wow. And I, and I, and Shots I, fired. I, I apologize. But I'm saying I don't want to watch FCS football if I've grown accustomed. You know, like when you see the divorce proceedings, yeah, like well, she's right. grown up or he's grown accustomed of a certain lifestyle. We're talking college football alimony here. College football alimony. That's exactly right. Damn. I have I have grown accustomed to a certain lifestyle and I am not willing to go back. All right. Uh, let's go to Mason. Mason okay. Moore writes in. And he says, since Bill Connolly is the world's biggest New Mexico state fan, can you guys take the mantle of being big Utah State fans? What up, Aggies? Mm. Or maybe one of you could take Texas A&M and each of you could have your own Aggie allegiance. Uh, this isn't so much a question as it is a proposal. And since it is the end of February, Mason, you're on the board early. Uh, we can consider this as the year moves on. I'm, I'm open to being an Aggie faithful of some kind. Timely question with Chucky Keaton entering his junior year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long he's been there. I assume he has just gotten medical red shirts in perpetuity. I apologize if Chucky Keaton Chucky is Keaton dead or no longer playing football. found the flower pot and is traveling back in time to continue playing college football. <laughs> boo, boo, boo. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I could be a Texas A&M fan. I just I, I don't think it meshes well with my personality. It's an exciting new era, though, with Jimbo Fisher, Dan. I suppose. Nothing like getting on board with a coach whose last fan base hated him for playing slowly right after I decried teams who play slowly um i i'm on board with uc davis ty all right the aggies of uc davis robert mondavi is bob mondavi from out there i believe i think that is the it's like the robert mondavi school of something of wine i think it, what is what is wine science do we know oh boy what is w- that why not looking it up I have right no now idea look that up i'm a big fan of bob mondavi's fume blanc <laughs> I like that you call him Bob on top. He's, he's known as Bob in this household. Wine science is called. Oh, man, I don't know. It's I just see winemaking. There has to be something else. A vinter. Sure. Does that sound right to you? Yeah. I mean, vinification. I have absolutely vintner. no idea. A, a winemaker may also be called a vintner. The more you know. Right. Okay. Have you been to a vineyard? Have you gone wine tasting before? I have. Yeah, I did it in Canada. And, Canadian uh, wine tasting? I did a Canadian wine tasting in Niagara Where? Falls. Where? Niagara Falls. Oh, so just on the other side of the border. Just on the other side of the border. How yeah. was it? It was great. It was cold. We went in Are April you? and it was freezing, but it was it was a cool experience. It's my first time doing that. Solid wife Kate, she's been other places, cool cooler places and done the the whole wine tasting thing, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. Did did you were you able to pull apart notes? From Pull your apart decanted notes. sips? Oh God, no! I have no idea okay. what I'm doing. No, I just, I just sort of drink it for sport, Dan. I'm not really into the whole tasting <laughs> thing. I don't drink wine all that often. I do like swishing it around, taking a sip, and I, I'll, 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 I will say, mm, subtle. I have a theory that most people at wine tastings have no idea what they're doing, but like to be seen as if they do. Well, the Michael Scott line was, "Oh, like that's a nutty afterbirth." Right? <laughs> it's great. Um. Next question. I may. Ooh, Michael is a mid forties Oregon State Beavers fan. Oh wow. boy, it's been a long, trite, miserable life for that man. Oh, okay. It was two thousand one the two thousand one Fiesta Bowl? Ty, your memories. Uh, I remember it well. <laughs> the best it's going to get in my lifetime, or is there something better out there? I mean, there's friendship and love, sure, <laughs> hobbies, <laughs> travel. Yes, there's all sorts of better things out there than being an Oregon State fan. Is is there hope for a mid forties Oregon State Beavers fan? And I would also add like teams that are Oregon State but not Oregon State. So across college football teams that have had brief runs of success but kind of have the deck stacked against them. Yeah, I for Michael here specifically, I'm going to say that was probably the pinnacle. Chad Johnson, T.J. Hushmanzada. If he's in his mid forties now, realistically now, let's talk life. Let's talk okay. lifespan in the continuous. What is the United average States? male lifespan in the United States of America? It's it's fallen fast high. Eighty one. Okay, average American male lifespan. Okay, seventy eight point seven. Okay, so oh, there's 
there's not nearly enough time for them to build up a program. So he's got, he's got what, 33 years? If he's mid 40s, let's yeah. say 45, just to keep it nice and simple. He's on the back nine, Ty. He's on the back nine, Dan. So could they conceivably build up a program in 30 years at Oregon State? To, it, to that eclipses a dominant yes. BCS group of whatever? Yeah. New Year's. How long did it take Boise State bowl? to get to a, a a point where we feel pretty good about their consistency? Twenty years? Not not in a Power Five though. If we use Boise State as an example, even though they're not Power Five, how many? No, it was it wasn't twenty. It was you know it was you had Dirk Cutter, you had uh, Chris Peterson, you had Dan Hawkins. How long? I, I, I it was ten to twelve, eight, ten, something in there. I say pick a different team. Oh man. He's going to die before they eclipse that. It's going to be rough. Eclipsing that in 2018 to 2030 is is just with the investment of Oregon and Washington and Stanford in that division. It's going to be a situation, has to be a situation of getting extraordinarily lucky with quarterback recruiting and keeping a quarterback right? and sort of finding a season in which... Everywhere, every position on the two deep is juniors and seniors, is upperclassmen. That's the best, and that have all developed and worked out. Here, here is my here is my question back to Michael. Not impossible. It's not but, no, nothing's impossible, but I I think yeah. he's more likely uh, to pass on to the afterlife with the Fiesta Bowl in two thousand and one being the pinnacle of his fandom. My question yeah. back to Michael is: Now that we have proven that much out, will he pick a different team? Will he play he his should. college football fandom like people try to play the stock market and sell high right. and now try to buy low on somebody else? You know what he could do? He's right there. If he is in Central Oregon or vicinity, that's wine country, Ty. Oh, Emmett Valley? That's going to be the new wine country because it's getting warmer. That's what I'm yeah. told by the Vintner. wine mix. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. I've, I've had good wine from the Willamette Valley. There you I go. Don't know what's good. You, you and your Bob Mondavi. Bob um, Mondavi, yeah. This comes to us from Adam. We've have we've received a version of this question before. Certain programs and fans seem to be alike despite being far apart. For example, the play, style, drinking habits, statues, excuse me, status of LSU and Wisconsin are nearly the same, so they are a match. Who are and they played? Who are the matches for your schools, Notre Dame, Penn State, and Oregon? Ooh. Um so stylistically, so we'll start with Notre Dame. Yeah. Um, it's it feels Michigan. I was gonna already? say Michigan. It's Michigan. Yeah, it's a hundred percent Michigan tradition. Midwest, you know, angry coach. Now, the only thing I don't know about Michigan fans, and maybe mm-hmm. you can help because you're married to one. That's I don't true. know the drinking habits of of Michigan folk. It's a it's a Midwest Big Ten school, big Greek situation. My impression of Notre Dame after tailgating there. Mm-hmm. a number of times and going to more Notre Dame games than I can count mm-hmm. is that it was much more of a wine and cheese crowd. There's an element of that with Michigan. Absolutely. If you could meld maybe like Virginia with Michigan, that would probably be the perfect match for Notre Dame. I would all, I mean, I think the the overlap is also, yeah, Virginia and Notre Dame, Stanford and Notre Dame is not terribly far off okay, because of yeah. academics. Um, but the thing that I think Notre Dame and Michigan also have is they, recruit students not football players but also football players nationally so my wife is from chicago she's not local to michigan but that is you know regionally local but i knew a lot of kids from calabasas high went to michigan a lot of like long island new york yeah, new yeah. jersey sure. michigan so same for notre dame with just like point two better gpas um anything for penn state penn state's ohio state isolated tradition Creative now on the field. Obnoxious sometimes as a fan base. Sometimes. Sometimes. I'm an alum. Okay. I, have to, I have to play coy here, okay? I'm going to pull up Penn Live comments real quick. I think it's um, Ohio State. Yeah, but give me something out of the region. Florida State. Oh, that's not bad. I mean, you had the long, long, long time coaches. That's still a looming shadow in a number of ways, right? Yep. Uh, another yeah, obnoxious think, quality. Sometimes you've got, you know, big enthusiastic recruiters yeah. yet to see the success for Willie Taggart. Okay. I think that's pretty good. 
Penn State and Florida State. Field what about more, right? What about Oregon? Oregon is off the beaten path a little in the region. You know, there's another school that traditionally has done better, but they've been the up and comer. Although now it's sort of back and forth. Oklahoma State, TCU. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's a team in the Big Ten, ACC, a little Virginia Tech ish. Okay, where they yeah, there's a there's a very that. specific brand, and even though it's different at Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech is definitely isolated. Um, you know, it's that that defensive brand, and I think it's very similar in the the Oregon spread offense and like the quarters whatever defense that Bud Foster lunch pail uh, they play in in Blacksburg. I think that that feels like a little bit of a comparison. And there's probably a comparison in Boise State as well, just because they're sort of the newcomer, one mm-hmm. of the newcomers, uh, flashy in their own right because they are a newcomer. Yeah. We want to address some non-football questions, but before we do, Dan, I, yes. I did want to ask you, have you made your own personal website yet? I know you were talking about just tasteful nudes, something of that variety. <laughs> it will no longer be tasteful nudes, Ty. No. Um I I have I believe I still own danrubenstein.com and I have thought about what to do with it. So, yeah. I the last web domain I bought was not for a website. It was fartgoblin.com, which I believe I still own. It's Fart Goblin? Yes. Do you know how Fart Goblin translates by the way to English or excuse me, to German? Uh you live in Germ- Germanic country over yeah. there in PA. Fart Goblin? Yeah. Translates to pumpernickel. Okay. And so if you go to farcloblin.com, you go to the esteemed and excellent Charlotte Wilder's author page on espionation.com. <laughs> that was a birthday gift to her. So fartgoblin.com. Check it out. Great, great. You were going to talk about something else. I was going to talk about Squarespace. They are supporting today's show. If you're ready to start your business or some sort of boutique website, as described by my trusted co-host Dan Rubenstein, make it stand out with Squarespace right now. They've got beautiful templates created by world-class designers. Mm -hmm. They make it easy to turn your idea into a new and unique website where you can showcase your work, your blog, you can publish your content, sell your products, services, whatever it is that you're into. It only takes a few clicks to create it. You can customize everything from the look to the feel to the settings to the products that are on said website. And it's all optimized for mobile right out of the box. So... Damn. Nice nice website, regardless of the screen that's going to be viewing it. You don't got to worry about installing or patching or upgrading anything ever. They take care of all that jazz for you. And if you ever have a question, if you ever want to know a little bit more about how the sausage is made, or if your sausage isn't being made correctly, Ooh. oh no, they've got award-winning 24-7 customer support, which is always there to help Daniel. Right now, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SOLID, S-O-L-I-D. You'll hmm, save 10%, enough. 10% now on your very first purchase of a website or domain. That's at squarespace.com and your offer code is SOLID, Dan. Man, I love how easy that is. All right, where are we going next here? I like this. We have dueling questions from SB Nation uh, ACC network sites. Okay. First, from the Miami site, State of the U. Shout out Cam Underwood. Arepas or quesadillas? Okay, pause. <laughs> you know what a quesadilla is. I know I know what a quesadilla is. Mm-hmm. Arepas, is that how you pronounce that? Yeah, it's... I don't know if it's South American or Central American. It's... I, I want to say it's like Colombian. Salvador, no, Salvadoran is pupusa. And arepa is like a stuffed corn cake or like a okay. corn cake sandwich, almost like a sandwich. All right. So if you could imagine like a very thick corn tortilla on a like a griddle stuffed with meat or vegetables or cheese and sauce and I got I, stuff I, like I gotta that. go quesadilla. I'm I'm it's the only one I've ever had, so I'm gonna go quesadilla here. I it's I can't even say the other one, Dan. So let's Arepa. go quesadilla. Yeah. I'm going quesadilla as well, just because I like a thinner corn tortilla. That's all it all is. Right. That's the personal preference. Uh, the one from the Clemson site, Shaking the Southland, just says Clemson defensive line question mark. Yeah, really good. And even though you don't, I agree, real good. Even though you don't have soundboard, whoa, 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 it's a complete dude alert, right? Oh my God, they all came back. I can't off the top of my head, which sidebar, there's not much on the top of my head. 
I cannot think of a better unit going into this season. Such a good unit. Yeah, there's the answer to your question. Do you want to ask ask the Braden one? Braden. All right. My roommate and I play tennis once a week in spring and summer. Mm. What's the most important thing I should work on to beat him? Now, a- as an aside here, Dan, uh-huh. I don't know if we've discussed this on the program before. Okay. Um, I have a friend with whom I've played many frames of tennis, many sets of tennis, many games of tennis. Frames of tennis. Okay. That was the first word that came to mind. Okay. Uh, I've only ever beaten him once. And this is after hundreds of games of tennis. Matches. Sure. Mm-hmm. I've never beaten him. More than like one game here, one game there. I don't know if I've ever actually taken a set. It's not that I'm unathletic, Dan. I suck at tennis. So okay. I am I am very interested in the answer to this question here, as Braden is as well. How do you get good at tennis? What do you what is the one thing you should work on? Honestly, like it's reps. You have to hit a lot of balls, but if you have an awesome serve, and I wouldn't say speed, if you can, and I'm sure you can look this up on YouTube, but you just you do have to go out and practice it. If you can develop a good kick serve, which you have to put in the time, it bounces the wrong way and uh, it jumps real high up. And if you are playing somebody right-handed, it will kick to their backhand, which is okay. generally the weaker side. That's my most genuine answer. The easier answer is you have to get in their head. <laughs> <laughs> because tennis is a, a mental game. And so I would assume most people who play tennis recreational are just as everybody is and not in amazing shape. You run them back and forth, you drop shot them a little bit, and it's just wearing them out mentally as well as physically. Saying things like, I'm, and this is stuff I, I tell to my mom to tell her opponents. I tweet about my mom's tennis sometimes. It's ridiculous. She gets in everybody's head because she plays a very, like, she's the Tim Wakefield of senior women's tennis players in Southern California. A lot of slice and weird curving. But it's sort of like saying, and I don't think she does this, like, wow, you move really well for your size. (laughs) (laughs) Stuff like that is... I can't see your mom saying that. No, Your she doesn't. I keep nicest trying to get her. I've ever met in my life. Yeah. She I she refuses, but I try to get in. I but get what you're saying is that, that she yeah. plays her style of tennis is my style of of ping pong. Yeah. I would I would Yeah, it's consistency. It's she slices off of both sides, but I would say learn a really good drop shot. It's cheap as hell, but if you're playing to win and it's not purely social, you got to you got to Pull out everything. That's what I'm saying. Pull it all out. All right. Where we pull it all out. Where we going Uh, next? Ty. Yeah. Let's go to John. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on recently? Oh. And this answer, this answer will be to be continued. (laughs) (laughs) But from what you can say, yeah. And I went through my recent Amazon purchases, and I do have an answer. But I'm actually kind of proud of it. As that's a good idea. Why don't Why don't you go first? Because I actually mm. want to do the same. I want Amazon honesty, Ty. So yeah. if, if you've ordered like a recent bomb, sure, or and by that I mean B A L M, sure, sure. Um, let's let's go order honesty here. I'm opening my orders now. First off, this you're is, you're living the prime life, correct? Oh, I, of course I live the prime life. I feel okay. a little guilty about it, but I do live that prime life. Okay. All right, I'm signed in. Yeah, please. Taco seasoning, USB wall chargers. Uh, a six pack of varying length lightning cables, a router, a book about the wire, a book about, oh, what is this? Oh, Shea, Shea Serrano's book of basketball. Maybe like the sixth umbrella I've ordered on Amazon in the past <laughs> year because I, I'm positive Jody with an eye has four of them in her office drawer. Uh, coffee, a humidifier, uh, Sony headphones, and this is where I'm going to stop, Ty. It's the very end of the page. I got this for Camera Guy Dave to return to at the end of his honeymoon because he he doesn't travel well intestinally. Poop like a champion cereal. Whoa. Highest fiber cereal. 100% of daily fiber and 1.6 servings. More soluble fiber per serving than other cereals. Psyllium colon cleanser. Low carb. 100% gluten free. Holy cow. Poop like a champion, and it's a, wow. a bowl of cereal on this box up on a golden pedestal in the clouds. Whoa. Yeah, but I stand by that. I'm not embarrassed by it. 
Man. Yeah, I don't. I didn't I don't, follow up to see how it did, though. I uh, the one that I'm looking through here that I see on my Amazon is I uh, w- went for one of those. I think it was one of those Kinja deals mm-hmm. that you see floating around all the time. Sure. I bought one of those Amazon Basics luggage scales. And the way it mm-hmm. works is you you kind of hook. Oh, my God, that is really nerdy. Yeah, you hook one of, like a strap around the handle of your luggage, and then you connect it back up with this little device, and you you just pull it up. And then it shows you on a little LED screen how much your luggage weighs. Now, I bought this mainly for Solid Wife Kate because she travels a little bit more for the day job than I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think she's ever used it. And I thought to myself, you know, this would be really good when, when I'm traveling, I can see if I'm going to be over the limit or not. I've really only ever been over the limit one time in my life, and that might have been my honeymoon. Most of the time, I don't have enough stuff that I can pack in there to go over like the 50-pound limit. So I spent $7.99, I believe, on this device. It may never be used more than once. I didn't realize you had so much disposable income that you had luggage scale money. That's right. Look at you. Yeah. All right, John. I hope that answers your question. That is a ridiculous item. I didn't didn't know what existed. Um, Ooh, I like this question a whole bunch. Even though we discourage these types of questions, I'm going to roll with it for this show. It's a coach question. Which Big Five conference... Or Power Five? Yeah. Power Five conference coach could eat the most hot dogs in one sitting. Ooh. Now, if you're listening, I assume your brain is going to go to who seems like the biggest eater? Who seems like the it's biggest It's going to go to like Brett Bielema or Mike Leach or somebody Not like that. Not active. Right? right. Mike Leach is the other. That's the second biggest coach you could come up with? There's no, 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 no. I'm just that. saying it's going to go to somebody like that. See, that's where I, I diverge, Ty. If you know anything about competitive eating it's the small it's guys. about the expansion possibilities okay the black widow kobayashi right. they're small but they can expand and i think being in good shape helps that i don't know if the muscle prevents expansion if it doesn't the answer is larry fedora he has the best yeah right the best core in college football i was gonna say tom herman because as we know from interviewing him and if you've done any research on tom herman mm-hmm. tom herman is a is a mensa society member and right. so my sense is that he would figure out a way to cut corners, a specific way to dip the bread in the water mm-hmm. and eat his hot dogs, maybe two, two and a half at uh. a time in order to game the system. And he's also in that, in that slider vein, right? Like right. he's not going to eh. be the biggest guy in the world, but he's, yeah, you know, he, he's kind of the average build. Herb's pretty slim. Mm. Herm Edwards. Herm Edwards, though, would see some sort of like meta properties in the hot dogs and wouldn't eat them. He'd talk about them. Right. Okay. I'm trying to think. Man, I'm looking across the conferences. Hmm. Brian Harson, Pretty, pretty trim. Oh, he's not power five. I'm going to go Larry Fedora. You know what I'm fascinated by, Ty? This is going to sound very strange. Hmm. You know what skinny fat is? Yeah. People who seem skinny, but they just have small frames. Right. Bathing suit goes on. You're like, ooh, weird. I don't. I'm trying to think who would be the most secret or like skinny fat coach. It could also be Tom Herman. It could be. It really could. It very be. well could be. Man, this is good. Tweet us who you think is the most skinny fat or strong fat coach. Because yeah. there's like the fat pack thing as well. But I think skinny fat is is more interesting. All right. All right. Next question. Let's stick with the Herm Edwards thing. Will ASU ever fulfill its decades long sleeping giant label? <laughs> that comes to us from Brian. And if I'm interpreting this co- correctly, it's that ASU is fun place to go. So should attract, you know, quality football players just because people like going to fun places. It's near Southern California. The weather's great. And it's in a conference that's not stacked with national championship contenders. So ASU should be able to win a division every three or four years. Yeah, given those things, will they ever fulfill its decades long sleeping giant label? I say giant. No, I say no, no sleeping small forward. Yeah, Yeah, maybe. I don't know. The whole Herm Edwards thing really has me spooked, Dan. I've been thinking a lot about this in the (laughs) offseason so far. I am so spooked. I have no idea which direction things are headed there. 
You know what we should do? We should do a Bizarro show. Because if we go through different conferences, we have, and I'm sure we don't agree on all of this, but there's a certain amount of conventional wisdom about each conference that, like, Nick Saban will never be bad at Alabama. Herm Edwards is going to be a disaster at Arizona State. Um, Willie Taggart is going to recruit super well at Florida State. You know, there's just... Everywhere you look, there is conventional wisdom, like an assumed, agreed upon talking point. We should do a bizarro show and figure out how the conventional wisdom can be completely proven wrong. Like, how would ASU, like, what is what is the formula for Herm Edwards to succeed at ASU, despite all of the, like, the, the joshing around about him? Well, the thing is, we're pretty booked up this offseason, Dan, but yeah, we true. might be able to fit it in at some point in, like, yeah. June. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. But do you have an answer to like what what is the secret sauce that like here is step and we can talk about it more on our Bizarro show whenever that happens. But like, give me the short version of no, it can actually work if Herm Edwards. The secret the secret sauce is that Herm Edwards and his little formula is good that it can build some level of consistency. Mm -hmm. And ASU might not be the best team or the most talented team out there. But they're consistent, very consistent on both sides of the ball week in, week out. And they're good enough to win nine games a year. Uh, yeah. That, I think, is is where you'd have to go with it because that's been a problem for ASU. They've been inconsistent. And when one side of the ball is clicking, the other isn't. So if they can get better than average on both sides and do it consistently, that gets them going in the right direction. I think that's right. I would also argue that... USC may not have a top, top tier coach like they did in the mid 2000s. UCLA has a, you know, it could be a, a situation where Chip Kelly isn't old Chip Kelly or, or previous Chip Kelly at Oregon. Boom or bust. Yeah. Yeah. Utah and Colorado are in pretty good situations, though. I don't know if the outlook for Colorado is great. And Utah seems like they always sort of fade, have like a November fade after starting pretty well. I, I think in Arizona is they have a, a very similar ceiling. I think as a school, they've succeeded a little bit more athletically because of basketball on a bigger stage, but it's a, it's a division without clear superpowers having everything together. And the state of Arizona, I want to say they, they churn out blue chip quarterbacks pretty much every year. It seems Kyle Allen, I know ASU has a current guy who was a a blue chip quarterback. Oregon is getting one this coming season. So there is enough local talent to build around. I would say that is the the path of hoping for coaching inconsistency at other programs and consistently getting and having a depth of quarterback that's higher quality than it has been recently. All right, Dan, where are we going next? Let's go two or three more quick ones here. All right, here's a quick one. John O'Mara, you want to read it? Do you have thoughts? Best Mike Tyson's punch out opponent. Mm-hmm. So is he saying best in terms of they're the hardest to conquer or Maybe. just best because they're like the most fun to knock down? Who is who is your favorite to face? Who is to you is the most well-developed character, most the best defined character? <sighs> I always had a hard time with Great Tiger. Of course. You know, with that little spin thing that he would do. I mm-hmm. always had difficult. He was like the third or fourth guy. I always had a hard time timing out that little spin thing he would do. Was it who disappeared? I think it was Great Tiger. It was Great Tiger, yeah. So for me, it's a toss-up between Great Tiger and Bald Bull, because Bald Bull is another one you had to time it out Tough. when he did that charge, right? Mm-hmm. Bald Bull, all the way from Istanbul, Turkey, did the charge, and you had to, you had to time it right, otherwise you get knocked down. Ty, I'm a showman. I love me some Don Flamenco. Don Flamenco, Yeah. <laughs> Flamenco? Isn't it flamenco? Like the type of Spanish dancing? That's Isn't what I said. From Spain? Flamenco. That's what I said. Don Flamenco. 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 Flam- oh my god. I Ty, I don't know how we're going to deal with this this autumn with you saying Mario Cristobal. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going Don Flamenco. Uh slight but fun. I Ty. think the most the most fun to face though, the yeah. most satisfying to knock down would always be King Hippo. Hmm. You knew what you were getting each time, but King Hippo knocking him down. He puts yeah, the he arm had a up, good you stag- punch him in the mouth, and in the, you know, you knock the pants down. That was always fun. I'm partial to a good Von Kaiser stagger back. Hmm. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's go to 
this was a very strange question and I assume it's a joke. I really hope it's a joke. If you're watching a game on TV at a friend's house and they ask you to stand for the national anthem, <laughs> do you do it? Uh, Has that ever happened to you? I'm confused by the question because like, obviously if, if you're watching the game, mm-hmm. the people that are being broadcast on your television are being asked to stand for the national anthem right? at the game. So Correct. is he asking, do you stand along with those folks that are on TV or is he saying literally that the friend is asking the other friends at the house to stand for the national anthem? Yeah, I think that's what it is. That has never happened to me before. I, I was going to say, if maybe that does happen, and I accept that it, it's possible that it happens, that would be so strange to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not taking a stand for or against it. I'm just saying that would be, that's, that's weird. It seems that a little is, weird to that me. That does seem weird. Okay. Um, uh, let's go one more question. One more. Last one. You choose, Ty. Ty's choice. All right, Dan, let's go out on a high note here just for you. Mm-hmm. Let's go to Chuck. He says, I like uh, this. If you had time for only one meal and you're staring at a barbecue shack, a diner, a burger slash fries joint, a taco truck, and a deli sub shop. So you got like five options here. The barbecue, chicken the diner. Chicken shack, he says as well, yeah. Chicken shack. Oh my gosh. Like mm-hmm. six options here. Which do you choose and why? Assume that each is an elite version of its genre. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which direction are you go? And again, your choices are barbecue, a diner, a burger joint, a taco truck, uh, a sub shop, and a chicken shack. Six options, Dan. So I'm going to limit. Well, so we need to know why we're short on time. Are we heading to a big business meeting? Are we going to pick up a child at soccer practice? Like, what is what is the time crunch? Are you going to catch? Are you trying to catch a flight? Yeah, let's say that. Let's say you're trying to catch a flight. You're going to be somewhere where physical discomfort will be enhanced. So I think if that is the context, Mm -hmm. you need to veer away from the taco truck. Oh, man. I I love tacos. Tacos are one of my favorite things. But taco before any kind of flight is, that's a recipe for digestive disaster. Disagree. Disagree. But continue. So I rule out taco truck in that in that little world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I rule out barbecue in that world because again, could be stomach issues following barbecue. Love barbecue, could be stomach mm-hmm. issues. Yeah. I also rule out the burger. The burger can bring on some stomach issues. That narrows. You're so it. worried about your intestines. I am worried. I'm on a flight. Okay. I know. You know what I happens live- when you go up and the I'm pressure saying- changes to your stomach. Purely, but let's say purely out of taste, your stomach is fine, but you, you know, you'll have this food sitting in your stomach for a long time. Uh, the pressure does weird things. I'm, I'm veering away from those three and I'm picking from the diner, the sub shop or the chicken shack. Those are all a little bit. You more think fried docile. chicken is just super mellow in there? It's more mellow than a taco truck, Dan. Oh, totally disagree. There's nothing deep fried about it. I am going to go very conservative here if I'm going on the flight. And I probably go either sub shop or the diner. A diner can be pretty greasy. You get a, what, a patty melt? Some steak fries? Going diner or sub shop. Diner, you got options, though. You're not pigeonholed into fried chicken or a taco or something that could really upset your stomach. I'm, I mean, this is not a shock. I'm doing taco and not thinking twice. I'm getting variety. I can control portions and starch and heft and greasiness, depending on which meat I get. Mm. Oh, the, the variables are so vast with the taco. If I want pastor, if I want chicken, if I want to eat lighter, I can do like a veggie taco of some kind. I think you got a, a layer of grease with the chicken shack. You have a layer of a grease with the diner, layer of grease with burger fries. You, there's, there's a heft to barbecue that's pretty difficult to avoid. Unless you get like turkey, which is, you know, barbecue turkey is fine. But I think it's taco for me. All right. We disagree. We disagree. To close out the show. Thank you to everyone who wrote in via Mm -hmm. social media. As we said, the next one of these we do at the end of March, uh, let's do a Reddit only. Yeah. I'm ready. We've got a very lively subreddit out there at reddit.com slash r slash solid verbal. Don't forget, you can also find us out there on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. 
We are about set to start working on a new version of SolidVerbal.com, which we're True. excited about. That will be forthcoming in the coming days and weeks and months. So stay tuned to that. And what else? We got anything else? I think that's it, Ty. Life right. is good. Well, Daniel, you enjoy your weekend, all right? Hey, you as well. To everyone out there listening in their off season, hope it's going well for you. Please do reach out. Let us know what's on your mind. In the meantime, for that guy over there, Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildebrandt, I'll catch you all on the weekend. In the meantime, stay safe. Peace.